Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. Can you all hear me? Okay. <laughs> My name is Isabel Lilias, and I'm one of the Ath Fellows this year. The term holocaust comes from Greek holos, whole, and kostos, which means to burn. Originally a biblical term referring to a burnt offering for religious sacrifice, by the 17th century, holocaust became a metaphor for premeditated massacres of innocent peoples. After the genocide of European Jewry committed by Nazi Germany in the 1940s, historians later called this particular systematic mass killing the Holocaust, but it is often also referred to as the Shoah, which is the Hebrew word for catastrophe. During the Shoah, every word, action, belief, and choice held immense weight over one's survival. With every interaction and exchange, Jews risked putting themselves and those connected to them in grave danger. When forced to tread the fine line of life and death, do you cooperate or do you resist? Do you comply or do you evade? Our speaker tonight will discuss the different patterns of behavior of Jewish Europeans in response to Nazi Jewish policy. An assistant professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University, Evgeny Finkel was born in the former Soviet Union and grew up in Israel, where he received his BA in political science and international relations at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He went on to receive a PhD in political science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where his dissertation won the American Political Science Association 2013 Gabriel A. Almond Award for the best dissertation in comparative politics. Professor Finkel studies political violence, East European and Israeli politics. More specifically, he is interested in how institutions and individuals respond to violence, crisis, and rapid change, and works extensively at the intersection of political science and history. He is the author of Ordinary Jews, Choice and Survival During the Holocaust, and is currently working on a book project that focuses on Holocaust survivors who fought in the 1948 war in Israel, Palestine, and is simultaneously working on projects that analyze the causes and impact of political violence in Eastern Europe and Israel. His articles have appeared in the American Political Science Review, Comparative Political Studies, Comparative Politics, East European Politics and Societies, Democratization, and several other journals and edited volumes. Professor Finkel's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Magrublian Center of Human Rights at Claremont McKenna College. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time. And please join me in welcoming Professor Finkel to the Athenaeum. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Isabel, for, can we put it off for some time? Can't, I'll turn it off, thank you. Thanks, Isabel, for the introduction. Thank you for hosting me, and special thanks for the Hemoglobin Human Rights Center for sponsoring this event. It's an honor being here, and thank you all for coming. Now, I'm a political scientist, I'm not an historian, and in academia we have this peculiar division of labor where historians study the past and social scientists study the present. So I'm, even though the presentation is based on the book that I wrote and published, I'm still not sure I had the qualifications to write this book, but that's again not for me to judge. So this book, I never planned to write it actually. And this book started as an attempt to understand one survival story of a one Holocaust child survival. And in many respects, it was a very unusual story. It happened in the Soviet Union, not in Poland or Germany. It involved no gas chambers or camps. It featured fake documents, bribing perpetrators, most likely with US dollars received from the US government, crossing state borders, and living for more than a year as a non-Jew among various Slavic populations. In other respects, though, it was a pretty typical story. It included a ghetto, and I will talk later during the presentation about what the ghetto actually is, because you know the war is being tossed around quite oftenly. Deaths, and 
a lot of deaths. But most importantly, it included Germans killing Jews and Jews trying to survive. And in their attempts to survive, making choices, whether to escape or stay put, spend their money on bribing Germans or Romanians who buy fake IDs, fighting back or simply going quietly to their death. And the outlines of the story, I knew them you know, from my early childhood. That's the story of my grandfather. But back then, it never crossed my mind to ask the question, why? Why did you make those particular choices? Why those choices and not others? When I became an academic and started thinking about those issues more systematically, and it appeared to me that you know, those are real questions. Why people behave this way? Then there was no one to ask. This person died a couple of years before I started my PhD dissertation, so I started looking at other survival stories other people, how they made their choices during the Holocaust and trying to understand what made individual Jews made the choices that they made when they faced this grave mortal danger during the Holocaust. And that's how this book was born and that's what essentially my book is about. And additionally, I came to write this book out of a sense of frustration of sorts. Frustration with what 70 years after the fact, 70 years after the event, we know about the Holocaust and what kinds of questions we're asking about the Holocaust 70 years later, later sorry, both as academics but also as a society more generally. And don't get me wrong, we know a lot about the Holocaust, probably much more than we know about any other case of mass murder in human history. Yet the questions that we're asking about the Holocaust nowadays have more to do with commemoration and preservation of this memory rather than understanding the Holocaust for what it was, an act of political violence caused by politics and heavily shaped by politics as it happens. And our focus on commemoration actually leads us to view those people, people who died during the Holocaust, the people who survived the Holocaust as some kind of quasi-mythical icons of suffering rather than human beings, flesh and blood, complicated, conflicted, often confused capable of both good and evil. We strip those people of their human complexities when we simply look at them as survivors and focus essentially and predominantly on what they suffer and what they went through. And as a result, when, it's the, when this is only their suffering that remains and this is, this is the only prism through which we understand those people, we inadvertently also somewhat dehumanize them once again. And that was another reason why I wrote this book. I wanted to give Holocaust victims and Holocaust survivors their agency back. I wanted to restore their role in this horrible story, not only as objects of someone else's violence as decisions, but also as subjects, as people with free will. Yes, their ability to act was extremely, extremely limited, but they still had a choice. Limited, it, this choice was, and hopeless usually, but the choice was there nonetheless, and the choice was there. These people did not just follow orders, or as, you know, to quote a horrible accusation that was thrown at those people not that long ago did not simply go as land to the slaughter. They decided, they acted, they did good things, they did bad things. Being subject to the most extreme violence does not deprive people of their humanity and their agency. And with humanity came the ability, comes the ability to make choices. So I wanted to bring Holocaust survivors back to this discussion. I want to look at their choices seriously. So before I, before I start talking about those choices, let me start a bit with history and how we perceive the Holocaust. And during the early days of Holocaust research in 1950s, 1960s, our study, the study of the Holocaust, the scholarship of the Holocaust was mainly political and social history. And it was constantly in dialogue with social sciences of that time. History and social sciences were working together to understand this horrible event. And not surprisingly, and I know that quite a few of you take, are taking a Holocaust history class, the person who almost single-handedly created the field of Holocaust studies, Raoul Hilberg, he was not an historian, he was a political scientist. Trained in political science, spent his entire career in the political science department, and the theories that he and people who followed him in 1950s, 1960s were straight from the social scientists of that period. 
But then, in 1970s, a divergence came. Social scientists went to do cross-national work that had very little to contribute to our understanding of the Holocaust. Because how can you explain the Holocaust with cross-national work, especially if you consider the Holocaust to be a unique event outside the realm of logical explanation? And historians on their part took a cultural turn and became less and less interested in political aspects of what happened. And the outcome was that for many years, the historians and the social scientists of the Holocaust, like myself, had very little to learn from one another when it came to the Holocaust. They were interested in very different things. They spoke, asked different questions, and even spoke different languages, literally. Historians of the Holocaust focused on Yiddish, Hebrew, Polish, Russian, social scientists focused on what was perceived the common research languages, and neither Yiddish or Hebrew were one of those languages. But then, about 10 years ago, an important shift happened both in social, science, social sciences and history, and people became more and more interested in political violence, not only as major in international wars, but also political violence as something that involves real people on the ground acting in certain ways. And that's how both the social science, social sciences and history finally turned to the Holocaust and started trying to understand people who were involved in the Holocaust. And the best two examples of this trend are two books, one written by a historian, Christopher Browning, Ordinary Man, and to Browning, I owe the title of the, my book. And the other one coming from social sciences is Daniel John Goldhagen, bestseller, Hitler's Willing Executioner. Those are the most important examples of this trend, but that was only the beginning. Yet, when it came to analyzing the victims, not only the perpetrators, as Browning and Goldhagen did, there was essentially nothing, zero. Because very few historians were in thinking in such terms. And admittedly, there was a good reason for that. Analyzing perpetrators was much easier. There were tons of documents and almost all those documents were in one language, German, and concentrated in one archive. And it was also a real puzzle how normal people become genocidal murderers. On the other hand, studying Jews required asking very different questions, and it didn't really seem to be a puzzle what is puzzling about people being killed in large numbers. And it also required studying and understanding very different societies, very different contexts, again, Slavic languages, Hebrew, German, Yiddish, one language will not do. So this is exactly the gap that I'm trying to fill with this book, in my, with my training in social science, and also a very likely combination of languages for which I'm not responsible. I was born in Soviet Union, in Ukraine, on the border between Ukraine and Poland, grew up in Israel, so by the virtue of Growing up in those places, I spoke Hebrew, Russian, Polish, Ukrainian, and could access materials in those, in those languages that most political scientists do not speak. So, what did I find? Well, in this work, I decided to focus on ghettos rather than camps because not many Jews actually experienced life in camps. You know, we think about the Holocaust as essentially a camp experience. But most Jews were either killed locally or guessed immediately upon arrival to the camp. So, so relatively few experienced life in camps, but almost every Jew who experienced the Holocaust experienced the ghetto. Now, what the ghetto is? We, of course, know the word. We use it colloquially. We use it to describe different things. Again, in this society, inner city, African-American neighborhoods would be the most common usage, but not only. I spent a year at Yale, and the area where the graduate students and faculty tended to live was also called the graduate student faculty ghetto. And, and you see this word being used in other contexts as well. But in the Holocaust context, ghetto was very simple. It was an area of a town in different towns where Jews were forced to live following the Nazi occupation. After the Nazis occupied a certain town, they designated a certain part of the town, usually, the usually at the center of the city or the traditional Jewish neighborhood, as the so-called Jewish residential area, and forced all the Jews of the locality to move into this area, and all the non-Jews who happened to live there to move out. And after this process has been, was completed, after all the Jews moved into this 
Jewish residential area. Actually, Germans very rarely use the word ghetto in official documents. Usually it would be the Jewish residential area of the Jewish quarter. When Jews, all the Jews of a certain locality would move in, this area become off, would become off limits for the non-Jews to come in and for the Jews to go out. Going out of this area for the Jews without a permission would be severely punished and often punished by death. So I, I decided to focus on those closed Jewish residential areas of those parts of towns in which the Jews lived and try to understand what was going on in those places. And what I did, well, first I started with a very basic counting exercise because we social scientists love numbers. So I decided to collect data on all the ghettos that the Nazis established in Eastern Europe, the main killing fields of the Holocaust. And again, we have a you know, pre-existing, pretty strong notion of what the ghetto is and how they look like during the Holocaust. Extremely crowded, high walls, people on the streets dying of hunger, and that's all driven by two very large, very important ghettos that tend to be heavily studied, the ghetto of Warsaw and the ghetto of Woods. But how representative those ghettos were? How typical they were? I wanted to see how a more representative ghetto looks like. Now, not only the big, two biggest towns in Poland, but also smaller rural ghettos. And luckily for me, several museums, the Yad Vashem Museum in Israel and the US Holocaust Museum in Washington DC also started collecting data on those ghettos. So luckily I had the materials to work with. And let me talk a bit about what exactly I found there when I started looking at the ghettos as a whole. So can we turn this on, please? Thank you. So the, first so the first thing I wanted to look at is how many ghettos were out there. And what I found is about 1,100 get 1 ghettos. And again, I'm looking only at the ghettos established by the Germans. There were also ghettos established by the Romanians and the Hungarians. I'm not looking at this. I'm looking at the ghettos that the Germans established. And I found 1,100 ghettos. Now, as you see, the vast majority of them, almost 700, were in Poland. That wasn't surprising. We knew that the vast majority of Jews lived in Poland, and we knew that the vast majority of ghettos were in Poland. What was surprising, though, is a very large number of ghettos established in the Soviet Union. We think about the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, and your colleague at Clermont McKenna, Wendy Lauer, does very extensive work on the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. We think about Holocaust in the Soviet Union as mainly a way of sh mass shooting. The Nazis come in, go to a community, kill everyone, and move on to another community. Actually, not necessarily. More than 300 ghettos in the Soviet Union alone. And those ghettos were scattered all over Eastern Europe. Some of them were huge. Warsaw Ghetto had about half a million people. Some of them were tiny. The smallest ghetto I could find had only 10 Jews. It was just a house in a small town. And they were all over Eastern Europe. Some of them were about 100 miles east of Berlin, so the heart of Central Europe. Some of them were not very far from Chechnya in the Caucasus. So that's when it comes to how many were out there. 1,100 give or take. Then I looked for how long they existed. And the ghettos usually existed, usually existed for a certain, sorry, for a certain purpose. And the purpose was to concentrate the Jewish population before or prior to their shipment to the camps by the Germans. And here you see the distribution of ghettos by the, sorry, by the duration of their existence. So where is the, is the clicker? Yeah, so here the ghettos that existed for several weeks or just a month, about 150, those are the so-called destruction ghettos. When the Germans would decide that they're about to ship all the Jews of the community to the death camps, herd them into the ghetto, and a couple of weeks later, or a month later, they are gone. But very many ghettos existed for a long time. A year, two years, two years, three years. The longest one here, that's the ghetto of Woods, almost five years. And that's quite a lot. And we also did not know that such a large number of ghettos existed for quite a long time. 
Even more interesting was to look at this dynamic by state. And here you see it by state. Again, most ghettos in Poland exist for quite some time. In the Soviet Union here, yes, there is a wave of mass shooting at the very beginning, but then again, many ghettos existed for a pretty long time. And the Baltics, the Germans come in, and two months later, almost all the entire Jewish population of Lithuania and Latvia here is gone. That was indeed a way of mass shooting and mass killing done mainly by the local Nazi collaborators, not the Germans themselves. But when it comes to Poland and the Soviet Union, many, many ghettos existed for quite a long time. And I wanted to understand what was going on within those communities when you have to live for years, years on end locked in this place. And we also have a pretty strong notion about Nazis coming in and started putting Jews into the ghettos immediately after they arrived. But that's also not true. Because when you look at the years of when the ghettos were established by the Germans, well, here is Poland. Most of the ghettos were in Poland were created in 1941, rather than 1939. So two years after Germans occupy Poland, they start putting most Jews into the ghettos. Before that, most ghettos did not exist. In the Soviet Union, yes, most ghettos was, were created in, nine, sorry, in 1941, immediately after the German invasion, but a certain, a pretty substantial number was created in 1944, 42, sorry. And one ghetto was even established after Stalingrad, you know, the breaking point in the war after which it's pretty clear that the Germans are going to lose this war, they start creating ghettos even after that. But the real shock was not here. The real shock for me was this one. And here I wanted to look at where the ghettos were closed or open. Closed meaning a physical barrier that prevents people from escaping. And again, here we have a pretty good notion of how the ghetto looks like, and that's the ghetto of Warsaw with its high brick walls. But how representative the story was. And here I looked at ghettos that did have a physical enclosure, something that prevented Jews from escaping. It doesn't have to be a wall. Actually, it was very rarely a wall. Sometime, oftentimes, it was a fence or the barbed wire. Or were open, meaning no barrier whatsoever. Nothing physical preventing Jews from getting out of the ghetto and escaping. And as you see, about half of the ghettos were open ghettos with nothing preventing the Jews from getting out and living. And here I'm surely undercounting the number of closed ghettos. Because in my counting, if the ghetto existed for two years and for those two years was an open ghetto without any obstacle, but then over the last week of the ghettos existing, the Nazis erected a fence, I would still code it as a closed ghetto because it wasn't closed in the end. And for many ghettos, we have no data whatsoever about whether they were open or closed. And that likely means that the ghettos were open because had there been a fence or a wall, then people in the testimonies or the documents would have mentioned it. So most likely, more than 50% of those 1,100 ghettos had no obstacle, no physical barrier that prevented the Jews from escaping. And I wanted to understand why. Why then they did not escape? What prevented them from leaving those ghettos, even if there was no physical barrier preventing them from doing so? So that's exactly what I set out to understand, the survival strategies and the behavior of Jews in those ghettos. And my key argument is, is in the book is that for the Jews during the Holocaust, there was a choice to be made. And this is why the subtitle of the book is Choice and Survival During the Holocaust. Now, the choice was limited. It was often horrifying, desperate, but it was a choice nonetheless. The Germans, no matter how hard they tried, did not succeed in depriving the Jews of their basic humanity. And again, with the humanity comes the ability to make choices. Not everyone behaved the same. And that's the base evidence that we need to prove the choices were indeed made. Still, I wanted to understand what drove those choices, why people behaved the way they did, and whether those choices were random decisions or whether there were general patterns that were driving Jewish behavior. And what I do in this book, I develop 
a framework of survival strategies that the Jews could choose from. The first strategy is cooperation and collaboration. That's the most controversial of those strategies, working with the German side in an official capacity or as private informants or enforcers, those who, those who put their lives above the lives of other Jews and actively or passively help the Germans. The second strategy was coping, just trying to survive while staying put within the ghetto. The third strategy was evasion, trying to escape. And the fourth strategy was armed resistance or organized resistance. People also could resist the Nazis and they did resist. And instead of looking at the Holocaust as a whole or one particular community, as historians usually do, I decided to focus on three communities. Minsk in the Soviet Union, Krakow in Poland, and Białystok, also in Poland until 1939 and then for two years occupied by the Soviet Union before the Germans came. And I chose these three cities for many reasons, but they were, the key reason was that they were very, very similar in most respects and most dimensions you can think of. The size of the Jewish community, the percentage of Jews in the community, the levels of Nazi repression, all those, all the three were closed ghettos, all three had Jewish resistance organizations and pretty active resistance organization, but they differ substantially on how Jews in those ghettos behave. Close to 10,000 Jews escaped from the Minsk ghetto, and that's a large number. Hundreds escaped the Krakow ghetto, but almost no one escaped Bialystok, even though topographic conditions were quite similar. And in fact, it was easier to escape the Bialystok ghetto than it was to escape the Krakow ghetto. Each ghetto had a Jewish resistance organization, but only Bialystok ghetto had the rebellion. And while each ghetto had people who collaborated with the Nazis, Bialystok ghetto had very little collaboration compared to the other two, and the life in this ghetto was pretty tolerable as long as the ghetto existed. In Minsk and Krakow, the ghettos were very disorganized, and the collaboration there was much more pervasive. So when I started trying to understand what exactly drove those differences, why people in those places made different choices, I immediately realized that I have to go back to pre-World War II times. And that's how, that's how pre-World, that's how, sorry, not pre-World War II, but early World War II period. And that's how the early World War II period looked like with, between 1939 and 41, when Poland was divided between Germany and the Soviet Union and Bialystok and Minsk on the Soviet far side of the border and Krakow on the German side of the border. But still, that couldn't give me an answer because Minsk and Bialystok were very, very different and in fact, Minsk was on the Soviet side of the border was much closer to Krakow on the German side of the border than to Bialystok. So I had to go even further back in time to the interwar period when Bialystok and Krakow were part of Poland and Minsk was part of the Soviet Union. But then again, even though Bialystok and Krakow were within the same state, the differences between them were very profound. And again, Krakow was much closer to Minsk than, in, to, Bialyst than to Bialystok in how the Jews behaved. So I tried to go back even further in time to the pre-World War I period with Minsk and Bialystok parts of, sorry, yes, Minsk and Bialystok, uh, yes, I pushed the wrong button, sorry, yes, that's the right one. With Bialystok and Minsk parts of the Russian Empire and Krakow a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Lotan eventually realized that no period alone could give me an answer. But the overlapping legacies of previous regimes, of the empires, Russian and Austro-Hungarian Empire, or the interwar states, Poland and the Soviet Union, and the two years of the Soviet occupation of Eastern Poland in 1939-41, while the rest of Poland was occupied by Germany, well, those overlapping legacies were the answer. And how the Jews behaved in those ghettos, or the differences between those ghettos had more to do with what, sorry, less to do with what the Nazis did and much more to do with how the Jews lived their lives before the Holocaust, and especially the political regimes under they lived. 
sometimes decades before the Holocaust, and sometimes before Hitler was even born. Those were driving this behavior rather than what the Nazis did on the ground. More specifically, I came to realize that several state policies had the most impact on Jewish behavior. The first policy was secondary education and schooling. In places where the state insisted on, on the schooling of Jewish kids in ethnically mixed schools, they knew, the local, they knew the local language, they knew the local culture, so when they tried to escape and pass as non-Jews, non they had the cultural and the behavior and the linguistic tools to do so. In places where the Jews and the non-Jews went to separate schools, Jews did not have those abilities. The second policy was whether the state encouraged or restricted the Jews' economic mobility, or whether the state allowed ethnically integrated labor market. Because when the state did, when that happened, Jews had non-Jewish friends or co-workers or patrons or client that they could ask for help. Where the labor market was ethnically segregated, those opportunities did not exist. By the way, can we turn this off, please? Because I don't need the map anymore. Thank you. The third policy was the state attitudes toward Jewish politics and whether the state encouraged or discouraged Jewish political parties or insisted on having ethnically mixed parties. And again, where political parties were ethnically mixed, it created a pool of people with resources and ability to help Jews who belong to their political organizations or allowed individual Jews to go to former elites and ask for help where the parties were ethnically segregated, where there was an electoral competition between Jewish and non-Jewish parties, those opportunities did not exist. And finally, I also realized that the viability of Jewish resistance was determined by the patterns of pre-World War II state repression. Where state repressed people, not because of who they are, but because of who they did, meaning selective repression, Jews who belonged to repressed organizations or Jewish organizations that were repressed had to go underground and learn the skills of being in the underground even before the Nazis came. And when the Nazis came, they already had the skills to organize Jewish resistance of their own. Where there was no, no repression or the repression was indiscriminate, Jews did not have those tools and when the Nazis came, they did not have the time to learn. So, what it boiled down to is that the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Soviet Union promoted the integration of Jews, not because they were benign liberal states or because they cared about Jews, far from that, especially for the Soviet Union. But what mattered was the result, not the intentions. And the Russian Empire and the interwar Poland did nothing to promote such integration. So the outcome was that Austro-Hungarian policies of ethnic integration that started even before Hitler was even born affected how Jews in Krakow behaved in 1942-1943. And in the Soviet Union, 20 years of pretty brutal, rather than denying pretty coercive Soviet social engineering forcibly integrated Jews into the, largest, into the larger non-Jewish society and the effects of that were seen during the Holocaust. So what that meant though, again, is that because Krakow, that was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, experienced those policies of ethnic integration, there many Jews spoke perfect Polish. And almost all Jews had non-Jewish friends and acquaintances, or even relatives, or lovers, or family members, to whom they could turn for help when it was needed. The same was true for Minsk where the Jewish society was forcibly integrated into the Soviet society. However, that also meant that the organized Jewish society, the organized Jewish community in those people was extremely weak in Krakow and non-existed in Minsk. Bialystok, on the other hand, was part of the Russian Empire and then part of the interwar Poland. And neither state promoted the integration of Jews, so Almost no Jews spoke Polish. The relation between non-Jews and non-Jews were hostile, but the Jewish society, the Jewish community was internally extremely strong, cohesive, and well-organized. 
And what that led, this led to during the Holocaust is that collaboration, especially private collaboration, the worst quote unquote type of behavior. So Jews who spied on other Jews and informed on other Jews to the Nazis or corrupt members of the Jewish police who shoved people into train cars to take them to the death camps. Well, this type of collaboration was almost non-existent in Bialystok because this community, the Jewish community, was strong enough to police its own members and to prevent those excesses. And it was much more common in Minsk and Bialystok where the community was very weak and essentially everyone was for himself or herself. Life inside the ghetto, as long as the ghetto existed, was also quite organized and much easier in Bialystok. In Bialystok, no one died of, hang of hunger and there was no starvation. So as long as Jews were inside the ghettos and not shipped to the death camps, it was much better of being in Bialystok rather than Krakow or Minsk. But the situation, but the situation changed, changed immediately when the Nazis decided to liquidate the ghettos. Then the tables turned. When life inside the ghetto was no longer an option, then Jews had to try to escape. And at that point, this well-organized, very cohesive, very proud, internally strong Jewish society of Bialystok was essentially doomed. However, exactly the things that made the Jewish society in, in Minsk and Krakow so weak, those also they were the things that allowed many people to survive. People in Krakow spoke Polish. They could culturally pass as non-Jews. They had non-Jewish friends to turn to. And the same also goes for Minsk. People knew who to ask for help. In Bialystok, the Jews had none. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that everyone who was asked to help did help, far from that. And the testimonies are full with very heartbreaking stories of betrayal or refusal to help by former business partners, friends, schoolmates, even lovers and, sorry, and relatives. But there were also many stories of brave and selfless help you know, by former nannies, classmates, co-workers, domestic help, even janitors. And without ethnically mixed schools, workplaces, or parties, those stories of help would have been impossible. So that's why what happened before the Holocaust and whether the state integrated the Jewish community played such a crucial role. And when it came to resistance, places that were subject to selective pre-World War II repression, meaning places where the state before the Holocaust, before World War II, repressed and punished Jews for what, because of what they did rather than who they are. Well, those places already had networks and organizations who knew how to operate in the underground when the Nazis came. And they immediately started blocking their resistance when, when the Nazis came. And places that did not have this experience living, under, living underground under much more benign regimes like the Soviet, like the Soviet Union or or interwar Poland, well, they don't have those tools and they did not have time to learn. In practice, who were the Jews who were repressed during that period? These were the Jewish communists in Poland and the Zionists in the Soviet Union. Those were the two, the two largest Jewish political groups that were repressed by different regimes. Bialystok was a part of Poland during the interwar period, so the Jewish communists were underground during the interwar period before, before the war. They also experienced two years of Soviet occupation in 1939-1941. And one of the first thing that, things that the Soviet Union did after coming to Bialystok was to outlaw all Zionist organizations, so the Zionists went underground as well. So in Bialystok, both the communists and the Zionists had an experience of working underground even before the Nazis came, and the result was that Bialystok has a very strong, very cohesive Jewish resistance organization, and the ghetto rebelled, and it was a pretty substantial rebellion that required the Nazis to use air force and tanks to put it down. In Krakow and Minsk, the Jews who wanted to resist the Nazis simply did not have the knowledge of how to do it. 
they had no idea because they had no previous experience and when they tried to learn, they did not have enough time to do it. And beyond Bialystok, it's also possible to quantify Jewish uprisings. We know how many of them were there and we know what was driving them. And most people who are interested in the Holocaust know about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. But Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was actually an outlier in the region or, or in, in the parts of Poland that were occupied by Germany since 1931 were 400 ghettos, only four rebelled. So 1%. In pre-World War II Soviet Union, only three ghettos rebelled. That's 1%. But in the region that had both Soviet, that was, sorry, that was Polish, Polish before World War II and then under Soviet occupation during the first e two years of the war in 1939, 1941, 7% of the ghettos had an open armed uprising. And when you think about power differentials between Jewish civilians and the Nazi military, it's a very large numbers. And we also know which of those ghettos rebelled, and it's pretty clear that the more politically active Zionists or communists were in the community, the more likely the ghetto was to experience an armed rebellion. So it's pretty clear that Jewish resistance is also linked to pre-Holocaust, pre-World War II factors. And the factors that shape Jewish behavior across ghettos also shape Jewish behavior within each of those ghettos. In all the three ghettos, the initial response of almost everyone was coping, just trying to survive, staying put, not making any risky move, just waiting it out. But as the time went by, it became increasingly clear to everyone that coping is not going to ensure survival, that if you stay put, if you just try to cope, you are likely, you are likely to get killed because that's the Nazi plan, and everyone knew that that was the Nazi plan. So what happens when people start realizing that coping is not going to bring survival? Well, then they have several options. And that's exactly the time when in Krakow and Minsk we see a spike in people escaping the ghetto. In large numbers, hundreds, thousands, not everyone escapes, but we know who does. People who can pass as non-Jews. Some of this comes from biology, having blonde hair or blue eyes certainly helps. It's also gendered. Female had a much easier time escaping because all the Jewish males were circumcised while non-Jewish males in, in Central Eastern Europe were not. So a simple trouser test would immediately reveal where you are a Jew or not. But even though, even when we look at people who did not have blonde hair or blue eyes, here, the crucial thing is being able to pass as a Pole or a Russian or a Belarusian culturally and linguistically. And that comes from being schooled in the native language or having non-Jewish friends. So in, Bial in Krakow, in Minsk, we see a spike. In Bialystok, no one escapes. Even if they have bl blonde hair and blue eyes, even if they're female, because they don't speak la the language, they don't know anyone in the most heartbreaking story that I that you know I could find in the archives from Bialystok is a moment when a family realizes that they are going to die very soon and then the mother starts teaching her son basic words in Polish like please or bread or water because the child even though he is of school age speaks no Polish whatsoever so how would you try to escape if you cannot even ask for bread from the locals and you would be discovered immediately as a non-Jew. So the Bialystok community, there are no, almost no one escaped because people realize that on the outside they have no option to survive. This option is close to them so they simply take their bags and go to the train station and board the trains that would take them later to Treblinka, regardless of the blonde hair and the blue eyes. And the min minority of Jews also deciding between resistance and cooperation or collaboration with the Nazis. And you know, we tend to view those as an opposite ends of the behavioral spectrum. Those who cooperated with the Nazis are the ultimate bad guys. Those who resisted the Nazis, those who fought back are the ultimate bad, uh, good guys. 
But what I discovered that these two groups actually had very lot in common. And what these two groups shared was their pre-Holocaust political activism. Both those who cooperated with the Germans and those who resisted them were politically active before the war, we, mostly within the Jewish community. So they already had an experience of working not for the private, but for the common good, the community good, and they knew others who also worked for the common good and, who, and with whom they could work with. The main difference between those who cooperated with the Germans and those who resisted them was pretty random. It was age. Older people were much more likely to become cooperators and collaborators with the Nazis, and younger people were much more likely to become the resistors. But that, again, was a random factor. Had the Holocaust happened 20 years later, those who we now praise as resistors would have likely be collaborators. And had it happened, sorry, had it happened 20 years earlier, those who we see as the ultimate bad guys in the Jewish society, those who cooperated with the Germans, they would have likely been the resistors, been the resistors. So we just age the different, differentiate those who resisted from those who collaborated. So to sum up, if we really want to understand how Jews behaved during the Holocaust and the Jewish behavior, all aspects of it, good, bad, and neutral, we need to take pre-Holocaust life and pre-Holocaust very, very seriously because I think the explanation of what the Jews did during the Holocaust lies less in what happened during the Holocaust and more with what happens to the Jews years and sometimes decades before the Nazis even started thinking about killing the Jews. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Finkel. We will now have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and either Lauren or I will come and hand you the mic. As always, priority goes to students. Thank you. It's a great question. I haven't done that because so the, da the data is pretty sketchy and the data that we had on the ghetto population is not a continue is not a continue. So the most ghettos had a census immediately at the beginning and that would be just one point in time. We know very little about you know about internal mo mortality within the ghetto. So so counting how, and people also moved from one ghetto to an to another, so any attempt to do that would give you, you know, a one-time snapshot of the picture rather than a dynamic picture. I don't think we have the numbers to understand to understand this dynamic. But frankly, I have so I haven't done this map. So fortunately, I can't answer your question. I will have to go back home and do that. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so my question is about uh, what role mm -hmm. did uh, the degree to which the locals were cooperative <laughs> with the German agenda play in whether or not Jews were able to escape or even considered it as an option? Uh, so it did play a role, but only to a degree, because every place had lo local non-Jews who who, collab who cooperated with the Germans. And every place had some non-Jews non who tried to help. The problem was how to locate those people who tried to help. And in Minsk and Krakow, those people were readily available. They already had Jewish friends. And we, we know who of non-Jews who tended to take, to shelter Jews or to hide Jews. Usually Jews who were hidden and taken by non-Jews were 
by people whom the person already knew before the war, friends, co-workers, you know, schoolmates. In Bialystok, those people certainly did exist, but how to reach them, how to find them, that was a problem that the Jewish community could not solve. So, so I would say that it certainly did play a role, but when it comes to you know, overall survival rates, I don't think it was crucial. I, I think, so I think it was more about Jews being able to identify potential helpers rather than the availability of those helpers, because they existed in every community. Hi, Professor. Thank you again for your talk. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. So just in terms of the robustness of resistance movements, do you think it had more to do with like pre-war, um, pre-war sort of, you know, counter, like, you know, counter Soviet and counter Austro-Hungarian measures than it did with the robust robustness of the Jewish community itself? So like with Bialystok, was it more the fact that they had been like previously combating whoever they were combating as opposed to like the robustness of the Jewish community there? No, I mean, the Jewish resistance or any underground at any place for that matter is about skills. You know, it's about not being caught and not being killed. And you need to get those skills. Now, I didn't know about, you know, Claremont McKenna, but at GW we don't have a resistance 101 class where you can learn those skills. And if we had, you know, folks from the other side of the Potomac would come after us doing these things. So you need to learn those things somewhere. And if you had a chance to learn those skills under a much more benign regime, like the interwar Poland, which was not killing you, then by the time that the Nazis came, you already had them. You already knew, for example, how to fake documents or how you know, to hide weapons or how to organize. So, so it, had more to do, it had more to do with the experience of being underground before, before the war, rather than the robustness of the, of the Jewish community and such. In Krakow, nobody knew how to do it. Actually, we have, for the Jewish resistance in Krakow, we had pretty good documentation because some of them kept diaries, which again, resistors or people underground should not do, right? That, that's what get you killed, keeping diaries. And we know how they try to construct the underground and it's just mind blowing like the, mis the rookie mistakes that they made. And I remember myself going over those documents and thinking, boy, this stuff will get you killed. And lo and behold, it did get them killed. So, so, so that was the story of the Krakow. And again, the same Zionist, the, the same Zionist movement, the same Zionist organization, just in one place, they knew how to do it. In the other, they did not have a chance. Had you know, the border been 100 miles to the east or to the west, the situation was, would have been different. But it's more to do with the experience of being underground rather than the robustness of the community. Um, thank you for your talk. Sure. So my question is about near the end of your speech, mm -hmm. you talked about how age, like speculating how age played a role in determining which, mm -hmm. like what group of Jews uh, cooperated mm -hmm. with the Nazis and which, which didn't. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering like, why is age a random factor in deciding like, like the level of resistance of Jews instead of like a, t a determining factor, thank you. Right, no, so age is not a random factor in deciding how to act. The, what's random is you know, the timing in which they had to act. So it happened in 1941, so people who were older tended to cooperate, people who were younger tended to resist. You know, had it happened in 1931, then we would have different sets of people because of the age. And older people tend to adopt you know, more institutionalized way of doing things. They're also less, less uh, risk taking. They also have families to take care of. Or the community, they cannot just go underground or to the woods and start fighting. So what's random was the timing of the event rather than the age. The age, the age is not random. It just coincided with what, with what happened. Again, had it happened you know, 20 years before, before or later, then different people would have been resistors or collaborators. Hello, thank you for thank your you. talk again. Uh, I want to follow up on that uh, question, actually, the, the age question. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like every potential resistor is, is a future collaborator. 
uh, the way it's kind of, because they have so much in similarity. So someone who is 21 and resisting, uh, 20 years later, he could be a potential collaborator. Uh, hey. is, that, is that kind of a... <sighs> I think, again, you know, it's probably so. I'm talking about, you know, in general terms and about patterns, but yes, that's a pretty correct description. And, you know, the hippies of 1968 is the hippies of 1980s and 1990s. So yes, people do change with age, but yes. I, th I, think, that, I think that's a pretty accurate description. People who are t in their 20s in 1941, you know, and were much more likely to go underground and fight back, had they remained in politics for 20 more years and had Holocaust happened in 1961, they were exactly the ones to collaborate. Yes. Hi, um, thank Hi. you for your talk. Oh. Um, I can assume, uh, hopefully I'm correct, that <laughs> your data comes from German records. Um, from, sorry, what? For, uh, German records. Mm -hmm. um, is there a possibility that towards the end of the war, the records um, could become a little incorrect or perhaps biased as they try to hasten their um, g agenda uh, as you know, they, their defeat becomes more imminent? Actually, none of my data comes from German records. They're all from Jewish records. I mean, besides the numbers of the ghettos that comes from a mix of records, my individual level data all comes from Jewish sources. Letters, diaries, testimonies, about 500 Holocaust survivors' testimonies. Unfortunately, I do not speak German, so even had I wanted to access German documents, I couldn't. My, here, here in this book, my focus is explicitly on Jews from their internal perspective. I explicitly did not want to bring German perspectives in, or Slavic perspectives in for the, even in for the, exactly for that matter. It's all about the Jewish community, what's going on within those communities. So all the sources are Jewish sources. Hi. Uh, I, uh, you talked briefly about uh, how some uh, some groups uh, of Jewish people who um, uh, before uh, um, the war went to school, uh, um, um, integrated schools. Uh, I want to know, like, to what extent, like, did that, um, did that aspect, like, like, like them, like, uh, knowing, uh, like, like someone, like, uh, uh, um, the German slang. Um, uh, uh, how did that contribute to, like, uh, their survival and, like, uh, what happened to them? Um, um, in the ghettos and like uh, the access to uh, to leave the ghettos and not be like like detected right so so that played an important role again I can't speculate about survival right we don't know the exact survival rate what I do know though is that their likelihood of trying to escape was much higher because again they could speak the local language without an accent they knew how the locals behave because they observed those locals, they were with them in schools. They also had friends who they could come with, you know, knock on the door and ask them, please shelter me for the night, and then the night becomes two nights, and then it becomes a week, and then it becomes several years. So, 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 the, school was, so the school was the place where they learned how to behave as non-Jews by observing non-Jews, and also created ties that lasted for many, many years, and ties that come from you know, being in the same class with someone for 10 or 11 years are much stronger than ties that are coming from working with someone for, for a year or two, or even being in the military for a year or two. Those are people you grow up with. Those are people, those are people who are much more likely to help you. Not everyone helps, but at least you know people at least you know where the doors you can knock on are located. So yes, it played, it played an important role in the, decision to, in the decision to escape the ghetto. And if you didn't go to school then, you know, it almost by definition meant that your Polish or your Russian would be heavily accented. It would also mean that you would not know how to behave in various social interactions because you haven't seen non-Jews acting in those social interactions or using, you know, very, or using, or using even catch words that non-Jews are using, like saying, oh, Jesus, or oh, Jesus Maria, which, was, which is how the Poles and the Russians spoke, but those were not exactly the words that were used within the Jewish community. If, you observe, if your classmates say, say, oh, Jesus, then you know, you know when exactly to use this word. If you go to a Jewish school, no chance. Hi. Thank you so much for coming to speak. 
I wanted to ask uh, a little bit about causation. Versus, I, I don't think I want to ask about causation versus correlation mm -hmm. in the age factor you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the argument, as I've understood it, is that perhaps if we ha if it had happened earlier or later, and depending on age, as age being a determinant perhaps of of action, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask perhaps how you sought to tease out and remove perhaps intergenerational cultural differences mm -hmm. or other such factors that might have influenced the decision of people at different points in time to either resist or to collaborate. Thank you. So, so. For that, the only way to do it is to ask, or oh, not to ask because most of those people are no longer alive, but, but look at how those people defined the, or talked about, about their choice between collaboration and the underground. And sometimes they were quite explicit. Sometimes you had a family in which the father was in the you know, Jewish council working with the German, and the son or the daughter were in the Jewish resistance. And sometimes the father would have a diary in which they would say, you know, had I been 20 years younger, I would have gone with them, but you know, I have a family to take care of, I have a community to take care of. Remember, those are politicians, those are people who are politically active. They are not thinking about themselves. Or younger people quite explicitly saying, well, you know, yes, we are resisting, we are looking, you know, we are looking uh, down upon those people who collaborate, but they are our fathers. So, so perfect causation cannot be found here. But trying to understand their mindset, it's pretty, it's pretty clear how they thought about this difference and that age was the key difference between them rather than anything else. Hi, um, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, I wanted to ask you, I, I've read some sources that say that uh, some members of the Jewish community would actually have to help uh, the, uh, the SS in guarding the ghettos uh, in groups called Sonder Commandos. Um, what was the Jewish animosity, what was the community, what was the animo animosity in the community uh, of, of, in the ghettos towards these people who had to help uh, the SS? Thank you very much. Right, so, so those who I call private collaborators, those who collaborate not to help the community, but for private gain. And here again, when the community was strong, they could police those people. Because those people cared about what others within the community felt about them. So, in B so Though all the, all the ghettos that had the Jewish police and most large or medium-sized ghettos did have a Jewish police, they guarded the ghettos. The question is how they behaved when they were guarding the ghettos or guarding the, guarding the entrance. There was some stuff that was permissible. So, for example, for a Jewish policeman, it was permissible to hit the Jew when the Germans were around. It was not permissible to hit the Jew when no Germans were present. And when the Jewish community was strong, they could police those people, they could sanction those people, they could ostracize those people, you know, to remove them from the, from the rest of the community. And when, and when that happened, then if the community was strong, then those Jewish policemen tend to be much more benign and much less corrupt than in places where the Jewish community was weak and there was no one within the community to police them or to monitor them. So again, in Bialystok, and the best example is again, the Bialystok, the strong Jewish community where before the final action, before the final deportation, there was another one in which 10,000 Jews are shipped to the death camps and the Jewish police refuses to take part in that. They say to Germans, you know, those are our brothers, we are not touching them, kill us if you want, we are not doing your dirty job for you. In Minsk and Krakow, there is no this sense of the community and there was, and people there don't care about what other Jews think about them, so there the Jewish police is extremely corrupt. And we see it in other ghettos as well, so, so it, when the community is strong, they can police their own, and they can police the police. Hi, thanks for your talk. I'm wondering if you have information on like, the Jews that tried to escape and the exact methods that they would use and how that might differ across the different information, so like bribery or sneaking, or like for examples. Right, so, so again, there, there are no limit to how creative people can be. You know, I can talk for hours about specific, about specific methods. Actually, escaping was not that hard. What was hard is surviving after you escape. And for that, you either needed money, a lot of money to take people who would shelter you, and that was risky because even if someone agrees to shelter you, they can betray you to the Germans and pocket the money. Or you need to have trusted friends. Or the cheapest way is to pass as a non-Jew. But for that, you need to speak the language. You need you know, to, to blend in. And 
there were creative ways to doing, to doing that. So for example, pretending to be mute when you speak Polish or Russian with an accent, or pretending to have a horrible tooth, uh, you know, toothache, so you know, binding your face with a scarf, or, or whatever, you know, dyeing your hair to be blonde. And actually, the, the, most, the most interesting procedure I found evidence was, is, was reversing circumcision. Apparently, there was a med medical procedure that could allow one to reverse circumcision, and that was used. I, I know it was used, I couldn't find any you know, testimony that would say, yes, I did that, probably because it was quite sensitive, but we know that, that that was right. So anything that would help you to blend in either, either physically or culturally would help. Or for example, a crucial thing that I did not mention, so speaking the language was very important, but even if you spoke the language, there was something that the Jews did not excel, and that's knowing the religious traditions and the religious habits of the local population. You know, like the Lord's Prayer. No, nobody among the Jews knew how to say the Lord's Prayer, even though they went to mixed schools and had Polish friends. That's not something that, that the Jews were exposed to. So immediately learning the prayers, or for example, if you have a Christian name, that knowing the day of the saint after which your name that was very important that was very important in Poland. And here again, having non-Jewish friends and especially non-Jewish nannies would help quite a lot because in Krakow, for example, many middle class Jews had Polish nannies who would have to work on Sundays and they would take the kids to the church for the mass because that was the only way for them, you know, to combine church attendance with work. So those kids knew, knew the traditions, knew, knew the prayers. They had a much easier time to blend in. Or because the Soviet Union w was absolutely anti-religious, there are many Jewish male kids were not circumcised. So it was easier to pass. So, so again, e anything to blend in and in places where the Jewish community was more integrated into a non-Jewish society to begin with, they had a much easier time. But the, the, speci the, spe you know, the specific strategies or the specific tactics, I can talk hours about that. It's absolutely fascinating. So if you want to hear more, come after the talk. I will be more than happy to share. Hi, thank you for hey. coming. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you talked about how cultural perception and academic um, analysis of the Holocaust and the people that lived through it had dehumanized them to a point where we just viewed them as victims. <laughs> and I was wondering if your book and your study of the Holocaust, if your intentions were to show people how to humanize the people that lived through, or if it was just to uh, give guidelines on how to resist and how to prevent Holocaust from happening again. Not necessarily the Holocaust, right. but situations like that ha from happening again. I was wondering what you intended for your audience to take from your book. Well, my, so it's, I don't think I'm as, as, as ambitious with this book as telling people what to do or you know, or how to prevent it from happening. I don't think we can prevent any future genocides from happening just by looking, just by looking at the Holocaust. My main goal is to show that these were people. And you know, that meant to showing the good size of their behavior, but also the horrible size of their behavior. Like collaborating with the Nazis, betraying other Jews, spying on other Jews, being utterly and utterly corrupt in many of those people, were indeed utterly and utterly corrupt, killing other Jews. So the, so the main takeaway of what I wanted to achieve in this book is to, is, to sh is to say, look, these were ordinary people, normal people. And they behaved like ordinary, normal people would with all the good and bad stuff. And we should not forget it. Uh, forget it. And we when we just focus on them just being, being survivors, then we take it away from them. This will be our final question. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of the, the numbers of people who were successful in escaping the ghettos. So do you have any even estimates in terms of, first of all, how many Jews are we talking about living in, particularly the ghettos of Krakow and Minsk, where Jews were more successful? <laughs> what kinds of percentages are we talking about in terms of those 
who were able to escape, and to the extent that you can tell us how many were successful, and by success I mean that they were able to survive the war. And if I could ask just one tag to that question. I'm assuming, given the kinds of strategies that you're talking about, that the Haredim are going to be far, far less successful in being able to adopt these kinds of strategies. Or, it, so my question is, is my impression correct, or, or do you have other information? Okay. Thank you. So, so we actually had pretty decent numbers for two of those three ghettos. So for Minsk, the ghetto had 70,000 Jews, 15,000 escaped, 10,000 survived. And that's a lot. In Krakow, again, the numbers fluctuated, but at the, at the largest point of the ghetto existence, it had about 50,000 people. Without, with Schindler, we are talking about 5,000 survived, mainly through escape without children just distract 1,000, you know, or you know, between, between 1,000 and 1,200. So not as much as in Minsk, but still large numbers who escaped and pretty substantial numbers of those who survived. In Bialystok, the ghetto was about, also about 50,000 people. In terms of those who survived, those, sorry, who tried to escape, probably less than two dozens. Those who survived by escaping, less than a dozen. So almost no one of those who, try, who, tried, to, who tried to escape survived. That, that community was completely wiped out. In terms of the Haredim, generally, yes, although I don't talk much about, about those people in, in my cases because Minsk did not have Haredim whatsoever. It was Soviet Union, right? Bialystok was not a typical Haredim. See, it was a working class community where the religious people were mainly folk religious people rather than ultra-Orthodox. Krakow did have a large Haredi community, but there is a twist. There, this community spoke Polish rather than Yiddish. So, so quite a few of them did survive, and quite a few of them did, quite a few of them did escape. But generally, yes, you're absolutely correct. Uh, for the Haredi ultra-Orthodox people, it was much harder to try to escape them than for the secular people. Yeah. Please join me once more in thanking Professor Finkel. Thank you. Thank you.